Thank you, Mark, and good morning. If you have attended Believer's Chapel for any length of time, you know that we preach through the Bible book by book, verse by verse. We begin at verse 1, we go through the last verse of that particular book, and I think that's the way God intended it. Can you imagine Phoebe bringing the epistle to the Romans, to the church in Rome, and that first Sunday, they announced we have a letter from the Apostle Paul. I'm going to begin reading in chapter 8. And then the next week, let's pick up with Peter's letter. No, they took the letter and they began reading in verse 1 and they read all the way through it. And that's how we're to study the books of the Bible. And that's an advantage for you because you get the whole counsel of God that way. I don't get to put the passages I preach. I preach what is coming and what, uh, what is next. And that's good for you and that's a challenge for me because when we do that, we come to passages like the one we're in this morning. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. I'm, I wonder how many sermons are preached on this passage in most churches today. I doubt that too many. But this is where the Lord has us. This is where the Spirit of God has led us, and this is going to be a blessing for all of us. The text is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, Modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet." For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Now, that word in verse 15, preserved, is the word the Greek word sozo, which is the word saved. And that's the common meaning of that word, but the translators have translated this preserved. I think the New International Version also has a similar translation, which is an interpretation. All all, uh, translations are interpretations in a sense, and that's how they have interpreted this, but we will deal with uh, that verse when we come to it. So... Let's look to the Lord and ask Him to bless our time together. It is a beautiful hymn. I just wish I could read it. (laughs) My age, that's... After he lost the presidency, Theodore Roosevelt sought adventure in the Amazon by taking a journey down an uncharted river with the ominous name, River of Doubt. When they got on it, it flowed gently and quietly. Then they came to the rapids and waterfalls that turned a gentle journey into one so treacherous that the president despaired of life and almost died. I think some might feel when we come to chapter 2 of 1 Timothy, verses 8 through 15, we're on a river of doubt. The verse at the end is difficult to understand. One of the commentators described it as notoriously difficult. And then statements like verse 12, I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence, quoting the King James Version, have led to the charge that Paul was sexist. What happened to Galatians 3 verse 28? There is neither male nor female For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul was so enlightened there, but here so narrow-minded. And things were so pleasant 
Paul was calling for prayer in the church and teaching that God desires all men to be saved or having this kumbaya moment when suddenly he wants women silent. It seems we've hit the rapids. Not really. What makes this passage difficult is not Paul, but what one writer called the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. It is a strong undercurrent of our lives. Paul said nothing here that contradicted his earlier instruction to the Galatians. Men and women are equal in essence, and Christian men and Christian women are equal before God. The differences are in the roles we play and responsibilities we have in the family and church. And according to chapter 3, verse 15, Paul's concern here is how we ought to conduct ourselves in the household of God. The world doesn't determine that. God does. It's his household. The spirit of this age is always against us. But if we believe that this is Scripture, and as Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, then we believe this is God's Word and it is profitable. So far from being treacherous or dangerous, this passage is revelation that leads to order in the church, the progress of the gospel, and will be a blessing for all who understand and obey it. Still, we can't ignore the spirit of the age. And since it has made these verses the most controversial in the pastoral epistles, they call for an explanation. But it begins with men, not women, and completes the previous passage on public prayer by giving instruction on where and how men are to pray. They are to pray everywhere, Paul says, that is, in every household of God, every church, by lifting up holy hands. Now, the point here is not posture. There are different postures of prayer in the Bible. The point is purity. The sentence ends, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Paul may have had Psalm 24 in mind where David writes of going up and standing on God's hill with clean hands and a pure heart, meaning with his life and thoughts in submission to God. Uh, Hands are a metaphor or a figure for the deeds that we do. We, We make things with our hands. We do things with our hands. They represent the deeds that we have and what we do. And what we do is determined by how we think, by our heart, by our mind. And so really it goes back to the mind and having a pure one. So I think Calvin is right when he writes that Paul has used the outward sign for the inward reality, for our hands indicate a pure heart. We are to to approach God without sin, without anger and quarreling. Those are among the things that frustrate prayer. It might be due to to personal rivalry, or it might be due to a failure in the home. In fact, Peter instructs husbands in 1 Peter 3, verse 7, to be understanding of their wives and honor them, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. A bad attitude, a wrong disposition, treating a wife in an improper way, sin hinders prayer. And Paul was singling out men here, and it's males that he's speaking to, of here as the ones who pray in the meeting of the church. But we must come to God properly in sincerity, not hypocrisy. And that that requires a vital relationship with the Lord, a continual relationship with the Lord. Prayer is a sham if it isn't the, the spiritual breath that comes out of walking with God. When we are, when we're walking with the Lord, our hearts will be forgiving and our prayers will be heard. 
<clears throat> Women were also a part <clears throat> of the meeting of the church. You see that from the connection between verses 9 and 8. <clears throat> Paul writes, likewise, that is, likewise in the same meeting, women have their responsibilities as well. And here he explains their role, first by giving instruction on their adornment or dress, and then on their relation to men. In verse 9, he advises women to dress respectably. I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments. Paul was not laying down a dress code. He wasn't he was stating a principle, which is that women should not dress ostentatiously, flamboyantly at the meeting of the church. The women in the church of Ephesus may have needed special instruction on this subject. It was a cosmopolitan city and women in the Roman world were enamored of luxurious fashions there are sculptures of Roman women with piles of hair and elaborate braids and curls that would be decorated with gold pendants and pearls. That was the style of wealthy women. But fashions change, so a dress code wouldn't work for long. What never changes for us, and what is the principle being taught here, is glorify God in your conduct and clothing. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Titus 2, verse 10. Adorn the doctrine of God. The principle there is what guides you in your thinking is glorifying God. Paul wasn't setting forth a menu for people. He wasn't saying, this ought to be your diet. Eat this and this and this and don't eat that. What he's saying is, you make that decision, but you decide according to what will bring honor and glory to God and what will adorn the doctrines of the Lord God. Our desire to glorify Him and please Him is what determines these things. And a woman's clothing reflects her spiritual state of mind just as a man's clean hands indicate his pure heart. So women should dress appropriately for church with dignity, this is the household of God. It doesn't mean that women were to neglect their appearance or diminish their beauty. There's no virtue in being unfashionable. In fact, in Revelation 21, verse 2, the new Jerusalem is described as made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. The eternal city and the people of God will be glorified materially, physically, made beautiful. So the Bible is not against material beauty. It doesn't decree austerity or prohibit enhancing a person's appearance, being well-groomed, having nice hair, being stylish. But there's a warning here for fashionistas not to be alluring or overly materialistic or obsessed with fashion. As a rabbi, I read, put it, not speaking of the church per se, but uh, made this statement, modest fashion is not an oxymoron. You can be very fashionable without being ostentatious. Be modest in it. Paul was writing to Christian women who were going to church. They were going to public worship to get to give their attention to the Lord, not draw attention to themselves. The attention that they were to give to themselves was to their heart, their character, their conduct, so that what people saw was not their stylish coiffure, but their good works. Paul says in verse 10 that this is proper for women making a claim to godliness. So as John Stott wrote, Paul is reminding women that there are two kinds of feminine beauty, physical and moral, beauty of body and beauty of character. That's true. And one of those forms of beauty has diminishing returns. 
Physical beauty fades, but the beauty of character only increases. Paul told that to the Corinthians. Though the outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. So the point would be invest in what is permanent. Invest in what is eternal. Cultivating Christ's likeness in good works gives a person the greatest value in this world and prepares her or him, because in principle this applies to men as well, prepares them for the greatest glory in the world to come. What is eternal and lasting? That's what we need to encourage. But that is learned. And that desire is created from the teaching of Scripture, which is what Paul directs women in the church to seek in verse 11. He wrote, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Now here we get into the thick of things. The rapids with words, the words uh, quietly and submissiveness. Those sound like code for chauvinism and male superiority. So sadly, discussions on this are, are closed before they even begin. Paul did not teach male superiority. The Bible does not teach it. And that's clear from Paul's teaching and from his life. Women assisted him in the ministry. Yodia and Syndike are referred to as his assistants in the ministry. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, he entrusted the book of Romans to Phoebe, who carried it on a dangerous journey across the Mediterranean to the church in Rome. He, he called her our sister Phoebe. That's equality. But this word submission or submissiveness is not about essence or worth in a person, but about function. Not everyone functions in the same way. God has not given equal authority to all. And we see an example of that in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, where Paul de de develops this division of labor. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. God is the head of Christ does not mean Christ, God is over Christ in essence. They are equal in essence, equal in knowledge and power and glory. They are the first two persons of the Trinity. But, our, but as our mediator, Christ is under the Father's authority. This is about function, not essence, not about worth. And men don't have greater worth than women. That's not the lesson of these passages. These are about function and authority in the church, what some would call the chain of command. It's been suggested that Paul wrote this to correct a new spirit of emancipation in the churches which the uh, women's abuses of their freedom were, had called forth this... Um, this instruction by Paul. Well, we don't know that. Nothing in the text says that. that. That's a guess, a speculation. Whatever the historical reason for it, whether he's correcting a problem or he's trying to forestall a problem, there is a natural desire among men and women to have authority and exert it over the other. And we know that from experience. I think we see a lot of that today. But you know it from the Bible, and that's really the most important point. In Genesis 3, verse 16, after man sinned in the garden and fell, God said to Eve, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. That is not about love and male headship in marriage and the church. It is about personal rivalry between spouses and the battle of the sexes. The consequence of sin is what our Lord is des uh, describing to her. He's telling Eve the consequences of what she'd done. 
The word desire is used in the next chapter in Genesis 4 verse 7 of sin crouching at the door of Cain's heart. The Lord warned him, its desire is for you. There's our word. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Master sin or sin will master you. And Eve's desire for mastery over, over Adam is what he is describing here. But she would fail. Male dominance is the way of the world and it is often a cruel dominance. That's sin. That's the result of the fall. Men's abuse of women. But in Christ that changes. The war is ended between God and man, between man and man. The war is ended between man and woman. And the two live in harmony and function as a unity. The original intention is restored in Christian marriage. Ideally, I say ideally, and I mean possibly as well. But ideally because we don't always meet that standard and we don't always meet it because we're still sinners. So it doesn't always happen as it should in marriage or in the church. So Paul was correcting a role reversal or the potential or possibility of a role reversal in the church, but not on the false notion that women are inferior to men. In fact, the equality of women to men is indicated in the instruction that Paul gave here that women are to receive instruction. Well, receive is addressing really the women. He's not saying men dictate to the women. He's addressing this to women, and it speaks of a willingness on the part of a woman to be taught, to receive instruction, a willingness to receive it, not reject it. So she has the capacity for doing that. And Paul's encouraging her to receive this good instruction. And also, it shows that women are to be taught the same as men. They can learn the same as men. They are just as intellectually capable as men, just as smart, maybe smarter. Kent Hughes wrote in his commentary, this passage is not about male or female superiority. Any honest male knows that the grading curve was always messed up by the girls in his class. I read that and thought, that's true. But we have biblical examples of this. The example of Mary. She was a virtuous woman. She was the Virgin Mary and a brilliant woman. In Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55, you have a, an example of that. It's her Magnificat, and it shows a profound grasp of Scripture, and that from a woman maybe 15, 16 years old. But also, there, there's nothing feminine about learning with entire submissiveness. That's how we all are to receive the Word of God, in submission with faith and obedience. Just like Mary, the, the sister of Martha in Luke chapter 10, verse 38, she was sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to His Word. She was devoted to Him. And in that, she was teaching men by her example. She was teaching the disciples by her example. This isn't about capabilities. It is about roles in the church. It is the role of men to lead. And since a Christian's authority is not himself, it's the Word of God, authority is exercised through teaching the Word of God. For that reason, in a mixed congregation of men and women, men are to teach. In fact, in verse 12, Paul wrote that women were not to teach men. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Now, it really can't be plainer than that. In church, women are not to teach men or have authority over them, which necessarily restricts women from being elders 
or preachers in the church. But again, that goes against the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. And so it's not uncommon for people to object to it by saying Paul was simply giving his opinion here or making a concession to culture. Paul began the passage by stating in verse 8, I want men or I desire that men should pray and likewise that women should adorn themselves in a proper way. So it's argued that that statement, I want, is an expression of of Paul's preference, not a universal rule that governs the ministry of the church. But remember, Paul spoke as an apostle. He just reminded Timothy in verse 7, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. He spoke with that absolute authority. And this word want, the Greek word bulamai, has the idea of an authoritative command. It's used, for example, in James chapter 1, verse 18, of God's decree, His will. And here it has that idea, I will. I think that's supported by a parallel passage, a very similar passage in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, where just after Paul wrote, the women are to keep silent in the churches, he wrote, The things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. So Paul was not expressing his preference nor accommodating culture, though that's a common explanation of biblical or evangelical feminists. Greek culture was not ready for women in the ministry. It's different now. But that really cannot hold up from the explanation that Paul gives in verses 13 and 14 where he gives the reasons for women not teaching or exercising authority over men. He says, For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. The basis of his instruction here It's not cultural, it's not his preference or whatever, it's biblical. It's grounded in the Bible. It's grounded first in the order of creation, which is pre-cultural, which is transcultural. Man's chronological priority in creation shows his priority in authority and function. Though, again, not in worth. Eve was taken out of man. They're made of the same stuff. They are equals. But the order of creation is important. Paul saw in this God providentially giving a lesson. It was by God's design and shows the authority of the man because he was created first and Eve was taken from him in order to be his helper. Man has the priority. The Bible teaches male headship. The second reason Paul gives for prohibiting a woman from having authority in spiritual matters over a man is the fall. Eve was deceived by the serpent. Paul was not giving Adam a pass here. He deals with him in Romans 5 verse 12. His sin was the greater. He sinned with his eyes wide open in colossal folly, in absolute rebellion. It was deliberate and it brought down the whole human race. But he's not the subject here. Women are. And yet, Paul doesn't say why Eve's failure applies to women today. Is the implication that women are more susceptible to deception than men, and so teaching is reserved for men who are not as susceptible? Some have taken that position on Paul's words, but Paul doesn't say that. And nowhere does the Bible say women are more prone to deception or prone to error than men. In fact, the Bible gives many examples of wise women. Deborah, the judge, was wiser than Barak, more courageous than Barak. 
Abigail was wiser than her husband Nabal, whose name means fool. And she was even more prudent than David. The book of Proverbs ends with the wise woman of chapter 31. Paul simply gives Eve's failure as a fact of history and a reason for women not having authority over men in the church. Now that's reason enough. It's clear, reason enough. We don't need to speculate on this. And in fact, speculation on it can be more harmful than helpful, more confusing than uh, clear. But for women who lack knowledge, for women who lack wisdom, Paul's prescription in verse 11 is the solution, just as it is for men who lack knowledge and lack wisdom, receive instruction with entire submissiveness. That's the way to wisdom, and that's the way to order in the church. But what can women do other than receive instruction? Is there there no venue of service open to them? The answer is, there is much that women can do, and many avenues of service, even teaching. Remember, remember, Paul is speaking here of the formal meeting of the church. But while a pulpit ministry to a congregation, that of pastor-teacher, is restricted to men, other opportunities are open to women. The New Testament is clear about that. Women are believer priests just as men are believer priests. Every Christian woman has been given a spiritual gift or gifts just as men have, and just as men are to use their gifts, so too women are to use theirs. There are gifts of utterance and non-utterance, speaking and not speaking, helps, teaching, all kinds of gifts. And like men, there are women teachers, and there are women who give the gospel very effectively. They're gifted as evangelists who are to use their gifts in the proper place and way. Acts 18, verses 24 through 28 is an example of that very thing. When Priscilla and her husband Aquila heard Apollos teaching in this church, in the church in Ephesus. They recognized his gift, but they also recognized that there was a gap in his understanding, a lack of knowledge. And so they took an interest in him. They both took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. It was in a private setting. They both explained the scriptures to him. In fact, that couple had a significant ministry in Ephesus, in Corinth, and in Rome. Priscilla as much as Aquila. But only according to Paul's instruction here, by learning and obeying. Here at Believer's Chapel, women have uh, always played an important role in the Sunday schools and vacation Bible school because we think they are more effective with children than men are. And they teach women. In Acts chapter, uh, rather in Titus chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul instructs older women to be reverent in their behavior, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage young women to love their husbands. Older women have a role with young women that men cannot have. It is a role of teaching. It's a role of encouragement, of personal counsel, and giving wisdom and direction, as well as doctrine. Always doctrine. Women are to learn doctrine as much as men are, to understand it and how it applies to us. So they're to teach. There are venues for teaching. And not to mention all of the other kinds of helps ministry. I was preaching this in the first service, and I noticed different women who are doing all kinds of work in the church. That's necessary and helpful. You're using their gifts in non-utterance gifts. There's all kinds of gifts that women are to participate in. And then motherhood, of course, is perhaps the most important venue for a woman's teaching ministry and passing on the Christian faith to the next generation. 
Now that's under attack today, as you know, but the, the, the importance of that cannot be overestimated. Few men have had as great an influence on the church as long-lasting an influence on the church over the centuries as Augustine. He is his mother Monica's gift to the church. She was unrelenting in giving him the gospel and praying for him. Susanna Wesley had a famous influence on John and Charles, as did John Newton's mother on him. She taught him scripture when he was a child and planted seeds for his conversion out of sin. Women have a great role to play in the work of God, in the home, in the church, in the world. I would say it's a role equal to that of men, but in different ways in the meeting of the church. And one way is to encourage their husbands to lead spiritually. Because godly male leadership is God's blueprint for the church and for a fruitful church. The role of women in the church is vital. Still, Paul's reason for women being silent in church may seem harsh and suggest that women are under God's displeasure. So Paul corrects that notion with a word of hope. But women, he writes in verse 15, will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Literally, Paul's statement is, but women will be saved through the bearing of children. So what does that mean? It certainly doesn't mean that women must give birth in order to, have, to children in order to have uh, eternal life. Uh, two explanations are women will be physically preserved through childbearing. It's the translation of the New American Standard Bible, I think also in the New International Version. And the problem with that is, is twofold. First of all, the word is sozo. It's a common word for being saved. And that's the normal sense of the word. Very rarely does it mean preserved. And also the problem is in just the facts. Many women have died in childbirth. Many. Well, it perhaps refers to the birth of Christ. That's another suggestion. No greater honor has been given than that given to women of bringing the Savior into the world. And Him coming into the world is the way of salvation for all, men and women. But if that is Paul's meaning, it's certainly an odd unusual way of making that point. It's not clearly his meaning. What I think Paul is doing here is referring to the most obvious difference in function between men and women. Giving birth to children and counseling women to pursue that and motherhood by seeking the greatest role a woman has and one men can't have, they will obtain salvation and happiness if Paul cautions, they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-respect. In other words, the path of salvation for a woman is through following God's will. You can apply this to men as well, for that matter. It's following God's will, not resisting it. It's through persevering faith, which is obedient faith. And not all women are, are called to be wives and mothers. So this is a general statement. B.B. Uh, Warfield and uh, his wife, a godly couple. Warfield, one of the great theologians of the latter part of the 19th and early part of the 20th century. They, they were childless. J. Gresham Machen, never married. He was a bachelor. Amy Carmichael, never married. So Paul is giving here a general truth, and what is true for everyone is salvation is through faith, a faith that obeys. Don't rebel against the will of God. Don't rebel against His Word. Within His Word is the Scripture, is the Gospel, rather, and we're to 
believe and believe to that. So don't resist God's will is what Paul is saying. That's not a path of salvation. Be faithful to God's order of creation and pattern from Scripture. Men and women are equal before God, but have different functions in the family and church. The church is fruitful and we are fulfilled when we follow God's will and the roles that He has given us. That's the life of faith, following God's word, not our will, walking by the Spirit, not by the Spirit of the age, and being servants of Christ and servants of one another. As I said, that's the life of faith, which by God's grace begins with faith, faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son and our Savior. Have you believed in Him? If not, I must say you're lost and in darkness on a river of doubt worse than anything in the Amazon. You are without God's light and will end in destruction. Be rescued. Be found. Come to Christ. Trust in Him. Then follow Him. He will lead you in the most fulfilling and joyful life there is. By God's grace, may we be submissive to his word and obedient to him. Let's stand and sing number 45 in the uh, songs of praise book, How Deep the Father's Love. And then, Father, we must all confess we have nothing to boast in. We can only boast in Christ and what he's done for us. Only boast in your grace. We thank you that he paid our ransom. Thank you for him. May we live lives and bring honor and glory to our great triune God. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.